everyone. My name is Gabrielle Long Curry. I'm a business professor in the Department for Systems Science and also a Center for Public Works Institute. And um, Tim, you're so kind to invite me to chair this committee, and I'm super excited to, to be a part of it. So thank you. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, the end of interdisciplinary program in environment and resources. So we're here for Shannon to attend. So um, one of your pieces is learning with fish and family how worldviews and lived experience shape fisher livelihoods and marine conservation. After the successful completion of the University Oral Examination, we hope to form the award to you uh, a doctoral degree, degree in environment and resources. So as part of Shannon's examination committee, I am joined by her lead advisor, Nicole Ardon. She is the faculty director of the Anna Interdisciplinary Program Environment and Resources, an associate professor at the Graduate School of Education. Um, and Nicole is also a senior fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment. I'm also joined by Larry Crowder, who is also a lead advisor, and he is the Edward Ricketts Provost. So, Provestial Professor of Marine Ecology and Conservation, and you are also a senior fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment. And I'm also joined by members of her dissertation reading committee. There is uh, Bill Durham, the Bing Professor in Human Biology and Department of Anthropology, and also Annette, oh, I hope I get the name up, last name right, um, Paul, Paul Bellison, Bellison, who's an assistant professor in the Environmental Policy Group at uh, the Wagenagan, Wagenagan, thank you, <laughs> University. So after Shannon uh, finishes her presentation, members of the audience will get to ask questions. I'm going to moderate this process, and I'm going to repeat it again after Shannon gets her presentation just so that we're all on the same page. So members of the audience who are joining us virtually will ask their questions by typing it in. I will read uh, those questions out loud to you for you to answer. And members of the audience who are attending in person should feel free just to raise their hand and ask any of their questions directly. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Larry for his introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, Shannon asked me to read this acknowledgement. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging that the space we're all sharing here today is of ancestor, ancestral and present-day importance uh, to the Mahuima Ohlone people who occupied this land uh, before we did. Um, and this, is, this kind of recognition is becoming increasingly important to people at the university who work in this coastline, but especially important to the indigenous people uh, who didn't necessarily volunteer to give up the space uh, that we're working on. Um, uh, Shannon asked me to do the introduction, and it took me a microsecond to say yes. Um, you know, uh, she was, uh, I, I met her when she was uh, applying to this program, and those of you who know her story um, know that she did an undergraduate degree, I think, at UC Santa Barbara. Um, she was a photojournalist and traveler and storyteller uh, for uh, a period of time, uh, and then she decided she wanted to go, get, go back and get a master's degree which she did, um, Master's of Environmental Management at Duke University in the Nicholas School of the Environment, where I worked before I came here. So uh, I advised some 60 or 70 students in that master's program, in addition to PhD students while I was there. Um, and I just missed Shannon by a few years. Um, but when she applied, I knew the program she was coming from, and I looked at the background. And that program, uh, kind of uniquely allowed students to combine natural science and social science and do interdisciplinary work. Uh, in some university programs um, that are uh, PhD programs that are more disciplinary or oriented like anthropology or biology, they expect you to do biology. And so you should study the fish but not the people. Um, and, uh, and what I say about those programs because I have my PhD students are in biology is interdisciplinary research is tolerated in those programs, and EIPER interdisciplinary research is celebrated. It was designed to do that. And so Shannon came in from an interdisciplinary master's program, and she would, she's like the ideal sort of person to enter the EIPER because she's strong in the natural sciences and the social sciences. Um, and in her dissertation, which you'll hear a small part of today, uh, 
she used really innovative techniques to deeply understand what's going on in the systems that she worked in. Um, so her life invited, it involved strapping on diving gear and going and counting fish, but also living with people. Uh, they're fishing in those communities and coming to deeply understand their history and so on. And I'll let her uh, tell you her story. But the kind of work that she did here really could only be done in a program like the Iper. Uh, because there's a little bit of anthropology and there's a little bit of biology. Um, and uh, I, I, when I was still at Duke, I invented a PhD program that's still going at the Marine Station that's called uh, Marine Science and Policy, where science means natural science and social science. So people could do an interdisciplinary degree there and have two advisors. And I invented it about five years after the Edward <laughs> formed the program here, but I didn't know about the anger. So I felt like there's a convergence in thinking about doing things this way. Um, and Stanford's going to roll out in the fall a new interdisciplinary school for the first time in 74 years that's focusing on sustainability science. And in that field, it's all about being interdisciplinary. So those of us who got to the interdisciplinary thinking early are glad that other people are catching up. <laughs> But it's really students uh, like Shannon who show us how this is done. Because I, I was really interdisciplinary, I did math and biology. <laughs> but I never studied anything about people, right? Um, and so the idea of having that be something that's not only, again, tolerated but celebrated uh, is something that's really important about what's happening in this program. A bunch of students here say, I wouldn't have gone to graduate school if it was about discipline. I'm only interested in doing this because I want to solve problems in the real world, and that requires an interdisciplinary approach. So we've all sung that song together, and we're members of a club. <laughs> and I hope you appreciate uh, Shannon's contribution to this field. It's been remarkable. Last thing I'll say is uh, I knew all the people who were writing her recommendation letters from Duke, um, and I, they were some of the most remarkable recommendation letters I had read. And I knew those people, and I knew they didn't, they weren't bullshitting me. From the <laughs> this is really what they thought about Shannon. Uh, when the dean of the Nicholas School at that time, uh, the comment he said about Shannon was, every time I hear about something really exciting and new and innovative <laughs> that's coming from the students, Shannon is like the dean. <laughs> okay, so uh, she has that reputation for being bold and being a leader. And, uh, thank you very much for coming on. Looking forward to hearing your talk. Right. Hopefully this works. Um, I'm gonna. Is it there? See it. Okay. Wonderful. Yay. But as long as you guys can see it, okay. Um, wow, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Dr. Wong Cody and Dr. Crowder. I am so excited to be here with you all today, and um, I hope you're ready to be transported to the watery world that you see here. Um, this is an image from one of the um, villages where I did this work that I present to you now. So the overarching goal of my research uh, is to understand um, how to manage marine resources effectively and justly by examining um, the ways, uh, what motivates the way people engage with their seascapes, as well as how coastal and marine ecosystems contribute to human well-being. And I came, I came to this work grounded in a social ecological systems framing, and that's um, depicted by this figure you see here, which aims to connect, uh, show how the natural system, or natural resources are connected with their social, economic, and political settings as you can see in this diagram. And I was particularly, particularly interested in how the user's component of that um, fits into this system. Um, but this, this uh, framework was developed by the esteemed economist Eleanor Ostrom and her colleagues. And thus it's um, rooted in a more positivist framing. And that is a framing where there's one single knowable truth. And so I drew on um, also other fields that take a more interpretive approach to, um, to understanding knowledge and that truth is uh, more of a meaning that is created. And so I took this pragmatist approach um, to this work by drawing on theory and um, methods 
from the anthropology of time literature, as well as um, the science and technology studies. And I did that to uh, really want to understand uh, how worldviews influence marine resource use and how that influences these, these so-called users in this diagram. And specifically, I was looking at ontology or ways of being and um, <clears throat> epistemology or ways of knowing. Okay, and so thus I alternate between more positivist and interpretive language throughout the presentation. So, uh, what are worldviews anyway? Well, they are, um, they don't all have one consistent definition. Um, they're defined in many different ways, but the, the framing and the definition that I've used to, to, for this work by Hedlund DeWitt um, says that worldviews are the inescapable overarching systems of meaning and meaning making that substantially inform how humans interpret, enact, and co-create reality. And um, recently scientists have increasingly called um, for examining worldviews in order to better understand how human behavior shapes marine ecosystems. And I, so then I look at these worldviews in the context of small scale fisheries and um, over 100 million people work in small scale fisheries, which is more than in any of the other ocean sectors combined, including um, shipping, oil and gas and tourism. Um, in addition, the people who work in these fisheries provide um, from the species they target critical protein and micronutrients um, and not just that, but also the foundation for um, these, uh, for social, um, cultural, and religious practices that support overall well being for billions of people across the globe. Um, and as national governments are increasingly incorporating marine resources into their economic and conservation policies, um, there's been a call to formally recognize the rights and contributions of small scale fishers. Um, and that's um, in recent years been referred to as blue justice. And this blue justice focus is um, especially relevant to the context and the location where I conducted this work, which is in uh, the, what conservationists call the coral triangle. So this is the coral triangle. It encompasses these six countries that you see here. And it's incredibly, um, it's so called for its incredible marine biodiversity, including over 600 species of coral, 2,600 different species, species of fish. And additionally, um, there's, it's the, uh, that rich marine life supports uh, over 120 million people who directly depend on it. So I conducted this work specifically in Indonesia and specifically in the island of Sulawesi that you see here. And in Sulawesi, there's a very large um, indigenous population. Um, and one of the groups that, one of the indigenous groups that call this area home are um, the Sama Bajau. So the Sama Bajau are known are traditionally um, nomadic and known to inhabit parts of Indonesia as well as Malaysia and the Philippines. Um, and they're traditionally nomadic, and but in the last few decades have um, settled more permanently into villages like you see here, um, still very close to the sea, often above the sea. Um, and this is one of the villages where I conducted this work. Um, and they have always thus lived very sea-based lives and continue to live very sea-based lives. Um, not just directly depending on this rich marine life that surrounds them, but also having a unique um, cosmology uh, that consists of complex relationships with um, what, what are referred to as hantu laut, or spirits of the sea. Additionally, historically, there's been cited to be co uh, frequent conflict between conservation organizations um, and Sama Bajau communities, and that's what um, this work really wanted. I wanted to understand better what that, why that disconnect exists. Hence this work I share with you. Okay, so before I dive into the chapters, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of um, each one. And as you see these bubbles appear, those are um, the name and ties inside the bubble are the abbreviated titles of the chapters. So the first chapter was a visual participatory, um, so I, sorry, was a, a critical review uh, critical analysis and review of visual participatory methods, and it showed how um, they have they can be very useful in eliciting nuanced understandings of worldviews in conservation settings. And I co-authored that paper with my co-advisor, Dr. Ardwan, um, and it was published last fall in the Journal of Biological Conservation. I won't go into a lot of detail with it, but I bring it up because it helped motivate using participatory photography in the second chapter. So the rest of the chapters, I took an embedded ethnographic approach, living with fishing families um, for 
a total of 15 months uh, from 2016 to 2019, and about a year of that was consecutive. Okay, so chapter two, as I mentioned, I use a, um, a, photography, a participatory photography method called photo voice um, to conduct a comparative case study to understand how, um, to examine how time understandings influence resource use. And for that, I used, I draw from the literature of the anthropology of time. And my third chapter then um, analyzes a year, a year of buying and trading um, aquarium fish data to understand how the trade contributes to fisher livelihoods. And I draw from resilient livelihoods literature for that chapter. And, from, and then the fourth and final chapter, um, I examine what motivates and sustains destructive fishing practices um, and whose knowledge counts when defining what those what destructive practices means and from for that I turned to the science and technology studies field um, to engage with the notion of amphibiousness. Now before I get into the chapters I just want to acknowledge the lenses to which I came to this work um, and that's as an outsider from a place of relative a position of relative power um, from a elite western um, institution and um, from a, her a European settler her uh, ancestry. Um, and also, uh, and I wanna acknowledge those because I want to acknowledge that they influence, they inevitably influence this research. Um, and I also wanna be clear that I don't um, posit to speak on behalf of the people who I did this research with, but just strive to share as faithfully as possible what I learned with the understanding that it's a single moment in time of dynamically evolving people and places. Okay, finally, the chapters. So the second chapter I should say is the one I will spend the most time with. So um, <clears throat> there's a lot to unpack here, but the title is Durability and Extinction, Exploring Links Between Time and Marine Resource Use in Sulawesi. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, this chapter explores the ontology of time. And I'm guessing as I've mentioned time a few, uh, in a few occasions so far, um, most of you have, thought of the Western standard uh, version of time, which is one that is linear um, and neatly divisible, organized into discrete seconds, uh, discrete units of seconds, minutes, hours, 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. But that actually, uh, that formulation of time wasn't officially uh, um, adopted as the international standard until 1884. Um, and so scholars have argued that it's neither inherent to nor um, congruent with the natural world of celestial forces from which it was originally derived. <clears throat> and thus, throughout history, there's been numerous other ways of knowing time, um, many of which have been documented in the field of anthropology, cultural anthropology. And that's the case with the Sama Bajau. Um, and it's said that they have a more cyclical understanding of time that's been shaped by this longstanding relationship with the sea. <clears throat> More specifically, um, it's been said, or it's been thought that their um, time, this cyclical time understanding has been formed by the natural forces that shape fish behavior, so specifically moon phases, tidal fluctuations, um, seasonal wind and weather patterns. Um, the cyclical time understanding, which keeps them keyed into the present conditions, um, is said to be incongruent with conservation approaches that often require short-term sacrifice in the present for a long-term gain in the future. And this ontological incongruency of time has been cited as one potential reason for the frequent conflict noted between conservation entities and um, some of the Zhao populations. But to the best of my knowledge has not yet been empirically examined, and so that was the motivation for this chapter. Okay, so to explore this theory, I conducted a comparative case study working um, in two vi fishing villages in central Sulawesi, which you see here in the yellow, um, and then specifically in the Bangai Archipelago, and specifically on and around Bangai Island, in what I will refer to as the main island village and the, at the top there, and then the outer island village at the bottom. <clears throat> and I should mention I use descriptor names and or pseudonyms throughout to maintain anonymity. Uh, so the marine ecosystem that surrounds these are mainly coral reefs, um, seagrass, and mangrove. And there's several similarities between the two villages. So both villages are, uh, have large Sama Bajau population. Um, both fish for subsistence as well as um, they sell their catch to international and local markets. 
Um, and they're both, they both will be affected by a marine protected area, or MPA, that was formally legislated in 2019 when I was in the field. Um, and so thus this work aims to help inform those policies as, they, um, as the marine protected area becomes operational. Uh, and then, so those are some of the similarities, and then some of the differences other than location is that um, the main island village has had extensive and ongoing interaction with NGOs or non-governmental organizations, both local ones, um, a, a national one called the Indonesian Nature Foundation or LINI, as well as international ones or UK, and the UK-based one, uh, primarily Blue Ventures, called Blue Ventures. Whereas the outer island has had minimal to no, um, the fishers there have had minimal to no uh, NGO interaction. Okay, so the research questions for this chapter are then, how do understandings of time overlap and diverge between members of the two groups? And what do we learn about how time understandings influence marine resource use? <clears throat> and my hypothesis for this, um, for this study was that the main island fishers who have worked with NGOs would have um, a more future-oriented understanding than the outer island um, fishers. Okay, so to explore this hypothesis, um, I used um, visual, the visual participatory method of photo voice, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, and the, uh, the goal of that is to put cameras in the hands of participants um, in order to make space for them to depict and narrate their own lives. And the intent, or one of the intents is in doing so is to help rebalance power between participants um, and re uh, researchers and participants, as well as between different stakeholder groups um, within um, the participants that are involved in a given conservation or uh, social ecological setting. And um, this is accomplished through focus group discussions, as well as through broader um, dialogue with the broader community. And uh, one of the ways we did that in this, in my project was um, this gallery showing, which you can see here. So these are Fisher images. Um, and here the fisheries officers are reading about the Fisher's lives and learning about their lives. Um, when, when normally all the only interaction they have is the fisheries officers regulating the fishermen. Um, but in this case, they have an opportunity to have um, for dialogue and to learn about each other's lives. So I share this to give a flavor of the intent of photo voice and participatory visual methods. Um, and that now I'm gonna give more specifics on what I did for this chapter, for this project. So I lent um, cameras that could go underwater as you see here with one of the participants um, and had an initial training to train how to use the cameras and also to share the prompt, which was to take pictures of things um, that are meaningful to you and represent a specific aspect of time. And we'll discuss why they are important to you and why you associate them with either the past, the past, the present, <clears throat> the present, the present to the future, future, and the past, present to the future. And as I mentioned, two villages were involved and from each one, um, there were a total of 38 participants. There were 16 from the main island village and 22 from the outer island village. And in total, the participants generated 9,340 images. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I went through every single one of those um, uh, along with my field partners on reviewing them on my laptop. And then from those, they selected um, 1,910 images that we discussed. And then from those, it was a final of 1,110 images that, they, that had distinct and um, unique narration as well as a time association. Uh, and then from that data, I conducted thematic analysis um, coding the interview data uh, by topics that emerged uh, associate, that were often associated with a particular time category. So I'll give you an example. So <clears throat> there's a, when fishers talked about um, the history of a place or the, what a place meant to them, they often associate it with the past. Um, when they talk, shared detailed ecological knowledge, they often associated that with the present. Uh, when they made predictions from the images, they often associate that with the future. That was the first round of coding. And then from that coding, uh, I conducted, uh, uh, I found emergent themes that cut across those topics by time categories. And that's what I share with you today. So I identified three shared themes uh, between the two communities and three divergent themes. I'll start with the shared themes. So the first shared theme was that of durability. And these images I show you now are from the fissures that the fissures made. Um, and this one was made um, by a fisher, a line fisher from the outer island village, and it's, he said it represented the past to him. And this is what he said. In the past, we built the walls of our homes out of bamboo, or tetebe in the Bajo language. 
We use nipa or sago leaves for the roofs, but these don't last very long. We don't use them as often now because they are quick to break and we have to replace them every one to three years. <clears throat> Tin roofs can last 10 years and blow around less. So this theme came across very strongly between the two communities. Every single participant had at least one image that related to how long materials last. Um, in, in relation to their homes, like you see here, and you can see the leaves he's talking about versus the tin. Um, also in relation to the walkways that connect the community in relation, and in relation to fishing equipment, especially um, their boats. So the second shared theme <clears throat> was that of enduring. Um, and this image is made by a squid fisherman from the outer island village, and he said it represented the past to the present to him. And this is what he had to say. This is Musim Utara, or North season, when it is quite dry, and we have to gather the water slowly. It takes longer, but it is always there. It can take many hours to gather from the morning to the late afternoon, but we must bertahan, or endure. So this concept, again, of, of bertahan came across strongly between the two communities, and um, it was in relation to things that were difficult, like collecting water, uh, also electricity outages, frequent electricity outages, uh, as well as in, across both villages, the weather and dealing with inclement weather. The final shared theme was reciprocity. Um, <clears throat> this image is from a fisher in the main island village, and he said it represented the past to the present to him. And this is what he said. This is the Suku Sama system of helping each other to pasang tiang, put up the poles. It was and still is now. We call it gotong rayong, mutual cooperation. You have to help wherever you are needed and cannot be picky. A few people must fix their poles every year and we rotate who helps. You must put them deep in the mud so that the house does not sway. So again, both communities brought this up often, um, not just in relation to these very arduous tasks like you see here, but also uh, just spending time together and sharing um, news and knowledge with, with each other. Now I'll move on to the divergent themes. The first one uh, was that of extinction, and this image was made uh, by an octopus fisher from the main island village who said it represented the present to him. These kids are learning to recite the Quran for a Perlomba An contest. Elders of Suku Bajo used to recite phrases from the Quran to talk to the Hantu Lao, sea spirits, of the rocks at the locations where they wanted to fish to ask for permission and rajiki, or good fortune. In today's generation, not many people use this method anymore. Sometimes this causes trouble because the spirits are not happy with our presence. Now fishermen are pseudo chengi, already advanced, and don't need to ask the spirits anymore. Before we only used a tombak or spear um, and didn't have masks. Now we use more advanced equipment. So he, he, this fisher doesn't use the, words, the word extinction, but other fishers in the village actually use the, the phrase tirak bole puna, or we can't let it go extinct. And they use that in reference to um, traditions, as, as you see here, and in the sort of the sense of a loss of traditions, um, as well as actually with species that they, um, they depend on culturally and um, to sell. <clears throat> Whereas in the outer island village, um, the fishers really talked about their traditions um, and sea spirits as still being very much alive. Um, and additionally, when it, when it came to talking about the species that they targeted, um, they would often use a phrase similar to kadang ada, kadang tidak ada. Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. Um, there was never talk of them disappearing or, or concern that they were going extinct. Okay, the second divergent theme was that of investing. And this is a, again an image from the, the main island village and an octopus from an octopus fisher who said it represented the present to him. And he said, before there wasn't an event like this. And he's talking about um, celebrating the opening of a temporary closed, temporarily closed fishing area, which the NGO Linny and the fishers partnered on. I began working with Linny in 2017. In my opinion, there is Perubahan Sadiqit, a little change. Every month I get some money from the loans that our Simpan Pinjam um, Saving and Borrowing Group gives out. Though the capital isn't enough yet for all group members, we hope eventually to loan outside of the group to the rest of the village. <clears throat> So uh, fishers in the main island village, again, talked about this sort of this concept of investing. He's, he does in a way literally with finances, um, but people, other members of the village also talked about it in regards to investing time and energy and restoring um, their habitat around them. So the, the coral reefs as well as seagrass. Um, by comparison, in the outer island village, um, this type of language didn't come up. There wasn't this, this thought around uh, of restoration or of talking about saving money. 
And the final uh, divergent theme was that of regulation. So both communities actually talked a lot about wanting um, more interaction with government officials. Um, they, they both mentioned that. However, um, the main island village fishers wanted to have more regulation and more enforcement. They wanted help with more enforcement, whereas the outer island villagers did, did not want that and felt, felt confused by a lot of the regulations, which um, is what I will share here um, with this quote from an outer island um, fisher who was a spear and aquarium fisher. And he said this image represented the present to him of the coral there. Um, <clears throat> this coral is illegal to take, though we don't really know why. Before we would take it for decoration and to sell. It's been banned for 10 years now, and it has already grown back again. Suku Bajo like it, and so do the seahorses and cuttlefish. The government doesn't update or socialize develop capacity with us often enough, so people get confused about the regulations, and we especially need help in Musum Salatan, the south season, when it makes it hard to go to sea. Most of us don't have gardens. All we have is the sea, so we struggle. <clears throat> So those were the, the, the shared and divergent themes um, that I identified in the data. And if you remember, I hypothesized that the main island village would talk more about the future than the outer island village. And I think the divergent th themes show this to some extent, but I want to go, turn to the quantitative data to add a little more clarity around that. So this graph you see shows the percent of photos on the y-axis and that um, the number of times they were associated with each uh, time category, which is on the x-axis, and the orange uh, columns are the main island village participants, and the blue are the outer island village participants. <clears throat> so first we see that both villages did associate um, some of the images with the, the future categories. Uh, but we also see some differences. So in the main island village, um, they actually used, if you see here, um, the discrete time categories more often. So the past the present, and then notably um, the future, which they used um, over twice as often as the outer island village. Uh, and so this is where I turn to the anthropology of time literature and argue that in the face of um, feeling of loss of, of tradition and lifeways and species, the um, main island villagers have created a more concrete and controllable near future, which is what is referred to as a near future in um, the, the time literature. Whereas in the outer island village, um, we see that the, uh, the outer island fishers use the time spanning categories more often. So the past to the present, the present to the future, and the past, present, and future. Um, and that's especially true, you can see, with the past to the present, the blue column there, um, so which supports the, the qualitative data in that perhaps the fishers still see that they perceive their past traditions to still be alive. Um, and they also talked about the future, um, but they tended to talk about it, again, using these spanning time categories more. And so what I argue, again, turning to the anthropology of time literature, is that they see it as more of an indefinite and unknowable future, or what is called a formless future. Okay, so quick recap. Um, how do understandings of time overlap and diverge between fissures of the two groups? So this is the, the question I started with, as well as what do we learn about how these um, understandings influence marine resource use? So I showed that the main island fissures um, create a tangible, controllable near future um, and see species abundance as something they can cultivate by investing in and regulating it. <clears throat> Whereas the outer island fissures um, seem to be engaging with the future, but more of a formless one, one that stretches out indefinitely, um, and see species abundance um, that, as something that's largely out of their control. Okay, so so what? How does this relate back to conservation? Um, so I showed, um, these findings showed that fishers working with the NGOs um, seem to have internalized a more uh, discrete future focus, a more Western way of, of understanding time, which is again thought to be productive for conservation efforts um, by, uh, that require taking, making these short-term sacrifices in the present for long-term gains in the future. Um, but, so this seems promising as far as thinking about conservation in this way, um, but I, I think it's important to think of some of the ethics around what this might entail. Um, especially um, thinking about, is it potentially a form of um, time imperialism or imposing a Western way of knowing and being um, with potentially unforeseen consequences, um, especially in how that might relate to indigenous rights and sovereignty. 
Um, additionally, we saw that um, reciprocity and mutual help were important across both communities. Um, and so government agencies may wish to consider uh, reframing their policies to better account for these systems of exchange um, by using a reciprocal relations approach that um, supports a two-way flow of benefits and mutual responsibilities. And one way they could do this is by um, supporting fishers during the bad weather times, which um, they, met, they both mentioned, and they both fishers from both communities specifically mentioned needing help in, in Muslim Slatan or the South season. Um, and then for future studies, one could go in a more positivist direction and um, think about reducing the number of variables that differed between the two communities, perhaps by conducting a similar comparative case study with two of the main island, two villages on the main island. Um, and, or one could go in a more interpretivist direction um, and be more expansive of time understandings, because I already sort of framed the way to think about time using this past, present, and future. Um, as well as I already framed it of how, do res how does um, time understanding influence resource use, but it could be interesting to think about the directionality of that <clears throat> further. Okay, great. So I, met, I warned you I was spending the most time on chapter two. I will um, go more quickly through the other two chapters. This is chapter three, Finding Dory, Selling Aquarium Fish Enhances Coastal Livelihoods in Indonesia. And I co-authored this paper uh, with uh, collaborators from uh, the US and Indonesia, so in the US with um, Dr. Crowder and uh, members of the Crowder Lab, as well as colleagues in Indonesia from the University of Hassanuddin and Tadulako. Okay, so this chapter drills deeper into one of the fisheries that the outer island fishers from the previous chapter engaged in, and that's the marine aquarium trade. So the marine aquarium trade is a global industry. It moves more anim live animals around the world than any other trade. It, uh, trade, it involves over 2,300 different species of fish, and <clears throat> it's estimated to be worth about 15 to 20 billion dollars a year. So it's a big industry, but despite that, there's actually um, very little data of, or, regarding the trade, and that's especially true at the source level. Uh, so really very little data to understand how many fish are coming off the reefs. Additionally, it's been cited that um, the trade contributes to fisher livelihoods, but again, there's very little data, that, um, empirical data that um, supports this. Th thus, I use a resilient livelihoods framing for this chapter, um, which posits that increased flexibility and diversity in a fisher's livelihood portfolio um, will help support overall well-being and help fishers navigate um, the many stressors that they, that they face. Okay, <clears throat> so the research, I had two questions for this. One regarded the social network involved in the trade, um, but I'm just gonna talk about the second one today. How, do the aquarium, uh, how does the aquarium trade affect livelihoods in a primary source village in the Bonga Archipelago? Um, so for this, I worked with four individuals uh, in the Bongai region uh, who traded fish in the Bongai region to ha um, have them record their data for a year from uh, October 2018 to September 2019. Um, in books like you see there. So they physically recorded it. Uh, and what I share today are the descriptive statistics that we did to understand the data um, about the people and fish involved, um, as well as some of the predictive analysis we conducted um, in order to understand, why, oh, sorry, understand what might be affecting total um, number of fish sold across the year of data. <clears throat> okay, so first, um, the people involved. So we found that there were 111 people involved in the network, and that, that was about 24% of households in the community, in the village, um, and that it provided about 20% of income on average per um, participant. And while that is supplemental, it's still substantial, um, and so definitely an important part of the fisher's income. So now the fish, we found 74,000, over 74,000 individuals were traded and sold, which to give you a sense is about 1% of all Indonesian exports to the US. Um, <clears throat> and going into this research, uh, we knew that blue tang were being sourced from the region, that they were being caught there. And of course the blue tang has been popularized by the uh, Disney uh, movies, Finding Nemo and Finding Dory, hence the title of the chapter. Um, and it's also known that they're typically caught using cyanide, which is um, a, a poison that stuns the fish to make it easier to catch them. 
And that was what I observed um, mostly being used in this area. And then previously unknown were that the yellow go coral goby was also being sourced from this region. Um, and interestingly, the, in 2019, a study showed that they're one of the more sustainable aquarium species to catch based on their life history characteristics. And what I observed in the field in participant observation was that the fishers targeted the two species in different ways. So for example, as you can see here, um, this is an oct primarily an octopus fisherman who I went out with on several occasions um, to, when he was gonna catch these um, yellow goby, when in the weather was too bad to catch his um, octopus's primary species that he targets. Um, and fisher, um, he and fishers like him would seek out yellow goby in these more shallow areas that were surrounded by these, this um, mangrove um, and more protected. And they didn't use advanced equipment like they needed for the blue tang, like compressors and engines. They used these more these simpler tools, like you see the Ciroc here. Um, this that net is called the Ciroc. Um, and from so per, so from participant observation, it seemed that um, the yellow goby might provide actually some uh, income during the bad weather season specifically. So we wanted to examine this um, using the quantitative data as well as see what other factors might be affecting total fish sold. Um, or the number of fish sold across the year of data. So we did that using a linear regression, um, again, to understand which variables might be affecting number of fish sold, which is our independent, uh, sorry, our dependent variable. Um, and we normalized the data first using um, log transformations. So the independent variables included the seller type, the fisher and the buyer, the weather season, um, which we grouped according to the months of each season, so the north season, the south season, and the two calm seasons, um, which we considered as one group, and then finally the fish species. And so there, a number of the variables ended up being significant at the 0.001% level, um, but I want to share the one related to the weather variables, and that was um, that we, we found that 26% more aquarium fish were sold during the north season um, than the calm season. And I wanna give you a sense now, so the North season has rough weather, and I wanna give you a sense of what that looks like or feels like for the fishers. Um, so here is a quick clip. Um, so in the North season, there isn't a lot of rain, but there are strong winds and currents uh, and swells that come from the North direction. And it makes it very uncomfortable to get out to where the fishers um, fish, as well as dangerous. They were often scared of their boats breaking um, when they're trying to get to the fishing grounds. Um, so, so I just wanted to share that to give a sense of what, that, what I mean when I'm saying bad weather. Um, and then in the south, the south weather is similar, um, but it's coming from the different direction, and there's more rain involved. So I already showed that despite um, this bad weather you just saw, more aquarium fish are, um, were sold during the north season than the calm season. And so we also ran an interaction effect model to determine if there were any relationships um, specifically between the seasons and the fish species. Uh, and the only stati statistically significant relationship we saw was between the yellow goby and the south season. And we saw that 64% more yellow goby were sold than blue tang during the south season. And this aligns with participant observation um, that the primary blue tang fishing grounds are more exposed um, to the wind and swell of the south season. Um, but so, so while they, the fishers weren't potentially able to catch the blue tang in the south season, they could still um, catch the yellow goby. So this not only shows that aquarium fish add flexibility and diversity, but that each species potentially contributes um, uniquely. Okay, so quick recap. Um, how does the aquarium trade affect livelihoods in a primary source village in the Bonga Archipelago? So I showed that it contributes on average 20% of income for uh, about a quarter of the village, um, that fishers with less capital can target um, the yellow goby. It gives fishers an alternative in bad weather. And according to the resilient livelihood literature, this enhances um, fisher resilience. Okay, so again, what are the implications of this? Um, well, it's, um, <clears throat> the results from the chapter reveal once again that rough weather affects fisher livelihoods. And in this case, fishers have sought an alternative way to deal with this um, and seek income despite the bad weather. So again, seasonal patterns are important to potentially consider in management approaches. Um, and then also it's, I think, important to consider how the marine protected area might impact um, this access to this source of income. And finally, um, I, as I mentioned briefly, cyanide is still primarily being used, which is thought to have um, negative environmental impacts, which I'm now going to discuss. 
briefly in <laughs> the final chapter. Okay, so <clears throat> chapter four, the title is The Fishing Paradox When Destruction Does Not Exist. Um, I've been working on this chapter uh, with a committee member, Dr. Annette Paulusen, who is tuning in from the Netherlands very late at the, in the evening. <laughs> um, thank you, Annette. Uh, and this chapter was motivated more by a research puzzle uh, that I've come to call the fishing paradox. And that is that the, specifically in the coral triangle, which I, I've kind of touched on in the beginning, the major anthropogenic threat to fishing is fishing itself is often cited as, as the, major, the biggest issue around fisheries. Um, and that's as, as compared to um, pollution or sediment runoff from development or um, ocean acidification and coral bleaching. And specifically what's pointed to are these destructive, what are called destructive fishing practices as the biggest threat. Again, destructive fishing practices don't actually have a, define, a, a commonly agreed upon definition in the literature, but they're often the ones that are most cited are blast and poison fishing. And blast fishing, um, both of these are very efficient forms of fishing as well as illegal in Indonesia. Um, and blast fishing is prim primarily used to catch uh, food fish, whereas poison fishing is used to catch fish that you want to keep alive. Um, so the aquarium fish and then also live food fish. <clears throat> okay, so the motivation for this chapter was really wanting to understand why this paradox exists. Um, and in so doing, I turned to the notion, this notion, um, it, the intersection of cultural anthropology and science and technology studies of amphibiousness. And that is, um, refers to the ability to move in and relate different worlds that do not add up yet partly flow into each other. So we can think of this as land and sea or liquid and solid, but in this case, I'm thinking of it as the, the two different epistemologies or ways of knowing of the Sama Bajau and the conservation entities. <clears throat> so my research question for this is what motivates and sustains fisher use of destructive practices and whose knowledge counts when defining them? And the first part of the question uh, was what I really started with in this whole project. Um, but the second one evolved as I was in the field and spending time with fishers. And I think it's a really critical, important one to ask, critically important one to ask because it dictates um, national and international laws uh, that really have a, a real impact in people's lives. <clears throat> so for this chapter, I drew on my participant observation and focal follows, which, um, and this was in uh, the outer island region. Um, and that was living with fishing families. I went on about 60 fishing trips for about 460 hours at sea. And I draw on these rich data to conduct an ethnographic analysis that I share now. So what I'm gonna, I'm gonna briefly talk about blast fishing and what I observed, and then I'm gonna spend a little more time on the cyanide fishing or the poison fishing. So blast fishing, um, again, is for food often. And I predominantly observed fishers using bombs um, when they were frustrated and or bored when they weren't catching fish. And again, that often coincided with bad weather. And then I observed that the bombed fish were shared between um, families and the broader neighborhood. Um, and as a, as a sort of an act of reciprocity or of sharing and um, caring for one another. And this has been observed with other um, Samba Bajau communities and other parts of Indonesia. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the aquarium, aquarium fishing um, and the cyanide fishing. And uh, in this case, in this area, it was specifically cyanide that's used. Uh, some, there's other poisons as well. Um, and I'm gonna, but I'm gonna share some ethnographic moments with you. So when I first started going out with the fishers, um, they were using these nets that you see here, this, um, these small barrier nets. Um, and they're thought to be a more sustainable way to catch aquarium fish. Um, but when I observed them, they would get really frustrated with them. They were getting tangled in the coral. And often then, um, once the, they got the fish corralled into the coral, they would pick the coral up and smash it to get to the fish because it was, it would, blue tang are very shy and they like hiding deep in the coral. Um, so that was the way that they could get them out. So this visibly uh, seemed quite destructive, if you will. Um, but after several months, um, one of the fishers felt comfortable enough for me to use cyanide in front of me. Um, and so I share what this process looked like below. Uh, I share what this process looked like in the field notes here. Um, and this image is from uh, this day. So I was diving with Papa Gunadi as he was spearfishing. He was cruising along in the strong current when he stopped abruptly ju just above the reef. Then he quickly surfaced, tossed his gun in the boat, and grabbed a blue bottle with a white lid. I knew he'd seen blue tang. He dove down on his hookah line to the reef below, 
As I dove down to catch up to him, I saw him squirt the cyanide, bottle, cyanide water solution on a coral head the size of a basketball, wait about 10 seconds, and then wave his gloved hand over the coral. One, two, three, four, five small blue and yellow bodies floated like falling leaves to the sandy floor, and he picked them up and placed them in the pouch attached to his hip. He quickly resurfaced and traded the bottle for the gun and continued spearfishing. <clears throat> Um, so, sorry, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is my husband. Thanks for interrupting. <laughs> uh, so, I'll keep going. Uh, so, observing the fisher using cyanide in this way helped me to really understand why the fishers had explained to me over the past few months. Um, that using cyanide in the way they enacted it wasn't destructive. And that was, they said that was true um, when, even when they'd used cyanide in the same places, the very same coral heads coming back year after year. Um, they, and they believed this so strongly that they asked me to help them conduct an in situ experiment, a controlled experiment on the reef in situ to prove to the government once and for all that they were right. So I share these vignettes um, not to convince anyone that cyanide is not a poison or cannot be harmful, but to show that to the fishers, an outright ban on cyanide is illogical. And it's so illogical, based on their lived experience, and it's so illogical to them um, that they, uh, they desire to, to provide real hard scientific um, evidence to prove uh, that they're right. And so in doing this, I argue that they show this ability to be amphibious. Um, in that uh, when these two worlds, their situated knowledge and the scientific knowledge that dictates the laws do not add up for the fishers, they choose to flow into the world of the legislators and use the scientific tools of those who regulate them in order to be taken seriously. Um, and again, in so doing, they demonstrate their ability to, and willingness to be flexible in their ways of knowing. <clears throat> okay, so I started with um, the question of what motivates and sustains Fisher use of destructive practices and whose knowledge counts when defining them. Um, so I showed briefly that fishers use bombs when they're frustrated or bored, um, and that often coincides with, again, bad weather, um, that bomb fish aids food sharing and reciprocity, um, that fishers uh, do not know cyanide to be harmful in the way that they use it and in the space that they use it, and that, to, to address the second half of the question, that fishers demonst demonstrate this flexibility, this epistemic um, flexibility, to attempt to ensure that their knowledge counts as well. <clears throat> okay, conclusions, and I think like I'm actually right on time, which is so exciting. Uh, so taken together, um, I've shown how visual participatory methods can help in elucidating worldviews, and specifically um, through thinking about understanding of time. Um, I have shown that acknowledge how acknowledging Fisher lived experience and worldviews can um, reveal new insights about conservation approaches, uh, <clears throat> as can understanding distinct ways that species contribute to Fisher livelihoods. Um, and then I've also shown the importance of temporality and relationality uh, in Bajau Fisher lives, uh, whereby those agencies, um, or sorry, those working in government agencies and conservation organizations may wish to develop programs that are more attentive to these cycles. So finally, my deep hope for this work is it, that it helps move towards a, a blue justice for all fishers, but especially indigenous fishers, um, as an inherent part of sustaining healthy marine ecosystems. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Shannon. Yeah. So, what we're going to do is invite audience members to ask questions. And so, as a reminder, we want to open our website to you. So, if they have any questions, they can do it out loud. But if you have questions for Shannon here in person, feel free to ask them. Maybe, well, I or you take it. Tell them the name of this fish. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Tell them the name of this fish. Oh, okay. This is the um, Bombay cardinal fish, and it's actually, it's endemic. Yeah, it's so cute. This is a really tiny one, a baby one, but it's um, endemic to the Bongai region, and it's actually what first brought attention to the region by conservation organizations, because it's a, also a popular aquarium fish, and there were concerns about it going, uh, or become, you know, going extinct potentially because it's only found in that region. 
Yes, maybe. I have a question. So it's super interesting. Thank you for doing all this work. I'm curious, uh, when you talk to the conservation organizations, like how do they respond to some of your ideas around like, you know, time and those sorts of things? Like are they perceptive or it's sort of like whatever we're doing our thing? Yeah, it's a good question. So the, the organization Linny and um, I was actually, so I went in with this understanding that there's this conflict, you know, between historically between these groups. Um, but what I found with Linny was actually that they had seemed to develop a very productive relationship with the, with the community that they were working with. And they were very open to this um, and, and wanting to understand um, whatever could possibly be learned from it. And so they were, they were actually quite supportive of the process. Um, I haven't yet brought the, these findings to um, other conservation organizations and shared them uh, with, and, with specifics and more details about how maybe they could implement them. But yeah, I'm hoping to, I really would like to, because I think that there are some useful insights. So, yeah. Thank you. Bill. Kids, uh, how much amphibiousness did you see in the other direction from the conservationists <laughs> willing to sit down and listen to the sound of the bell? Mm -hmm. you know, it was cemented here and that the conservationists hear and uh, listen to the sound of the bell, but how far did they go? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. I actually had another part to the slide at the very end that was like, on the other hand, the willingness, um, you know, it needs to be sort of this more of a two way translation, right? Um, and it's been so, it's been cited in the literature that, and, and uh, Dr. Paulusen's actually done a bit of work on this, um, specifically with the Sama Bajau, um, and how there's this focus on educating and teaching the Bajau and, you know, teaching them to do, um, to take better care of their environment. But that actually isn't, they know, like, the, the um, they know how coral works, they know how, you know, they they have so much knowledge around how ecosystems work, and it's not, uh, it, this sort of educating one way is, is not a productive approach. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of room for conservation organizations to really think more critically about their programs and how they can build in more of that two-way trans translation. Um, I think there's something to be learned. You know, each community and group has something to bring, um, but there needs to be more of that flow. Yeah, thank you. Person, and then I, there's a couple online where you can go back to in person again. Well, I really appreciate the diversity of methods. Thinking about Dr. Crowder's initial um, comment about how you're the forefront and pushing um, a, a diverse methods are really interesting. I was wondering um, what more, if anything, you plan to do on both the net fishing and like the destructiveness of the net fishing and the cyanide and like the scientific you know evidence that the lawmakers might listen to about that. Yeah, those are really good questions. So the, the barrier nets, ha okay, they have been successful, in, I'm glad you asked this, in other areas where the uh, fishers have been able to work for a very long time with the organizations, and Linny's actually been successful with this in Bali. So where there's a much uh, denser population and there's a lot more support for the fishers to keep having those nets replaced by somebody that helps them, um, and also, again, to train them initially. And also in the Philippines, they've had some success with this. So by sharing that, I wasn't trying to share that, say that they're inherently bad, the nets, but that there's certain situations or contexts where they might not be the most effective um, or useful for the fishers. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And if it, the, it's just that where these fishers are, they're quite remote, and it's hard to um, get supplies there. Um, so it's just perhaps not the best approach. One um, alternative I've been looking at and working uh, talking about starting a new study with um, a colleague at the University of Hasanuddin, um, Dr. Abigail Moore. We've been looking at using um, clove oil as a, a natural alternative to cyanide because it uses the same skills that the fishers already have. Um, and actually, cloves are already grown in the region. They don't use the leaves to export, so you could use the leaves and not lose money from exporting the cloves themselves. So looking at different options like that, that might be more relevant to the context, yeah. You. We have two questions online. The first is from Nina Brooks. Um, she said, such amazing work, Shannon. Can you talk a little bit more about how you chose your study sites, how you built the partnerships necessary to do this work, and how the fishing communities have, um, have responded to your findings? Okay. Great, that was a lot of questions. So thank you, Nina. Um, <laughs> the first part was the, so I first came to the field site actually through a project that was funded by National Geographic, specifically looking at the aquarium trade. So that's actually what initially brought me to the region. Um, and I originally went to Bali and then found that the blue tang weren't being sourced there anymore and they were being sourced 
out and out and out, and then eventually I, I found they were actually being sourced in this uh, region in, in the Bonga Archipelago. Um, and then that, through that process, is how I built the relationships initially with Linny, who have been uh, incredible, um, and then uh, building out to, they first introduced me to the communities out in that region, um, to one of the fish traders, and that's how I then continue to build the relationships. And then the third question was, did they respond to that? Yes. So, yeah, that's an interesting question. So I'm, I'm still in the process of writing up the reports that I'm going to actually share um, with the government agencies and the village leaders um, that are would be responsible for sort of implementing some of the needs and assets findings that I had as part of Photo Voice, which was things that the community really felt that they um, were lacking and then also their strengths that they felt um, they had. Um, so that will be like some really tangible way to share back the findings. Um, and then I'm still thinking about the best way to share the, the time findings um, in a way that would be relevant or useful. Um, and then also I'm thinking, trying to think about a format to, to, I printed a book of photographs for every participant as part of uh, being as a thank you. Um, but I'm trying to find an online way to, to work with the fishers to display the images they want to, you know, to really share to a broader community. So I'm still working on that. One more online, and then we'll go back in person, and then we have another question online. Is there any, so this is just from um, someone who's anonymous, is there any particular reason why conservation organization worked in one of the islands and not the other? <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question. Um, so initially, Linny, I'm trying to go back. I actually have a whole set of interviews that I didn't include in the dissertation that were with the Linny staff um, and government, uh, government uh, staff that delved into the history of how the relationship started in the, in the region. Um, but again, the, it, it started initially because of this interest in the Bongai cardinal fish, that endemic fish. Um, and at the time, the village who I didn't show on the map that I actually also did photo voice with, um, Bone Baru, they were um, a source for one of the, of the Bongai fish. And I'm, I feel like I'm going off tangent here, but they, um, that is why they originally started working with that particular community. Um, and I think they're wanting to expand their work in the area. And so that's why they were interested in helping me a bit with working in some of the outer island villages to develop relationships out there as well. Yeah. And is that a conversation that you've had with Lenny? <clears throat> no, actually, I haven't had that yet. And it's a, it uh, isn't something that was as obvious to me when I was in the field. And I think uh, having that sort of like separation and then this sort of abstraction of time and it, it yeah, it evolved as I've been doing more of the analysis. So it's something, yeah, that I'm actually excited to sit down and really share with them and work and think about together. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, any other in-person questions? Mm, okay, we've got another one online. And if you have another to think about, you can shout out after this one. So this one's from um, <coughs> and she says, in terms of your study about time, was there any difference in formal schooling between the inner and outer islands? There is quite a bit of research showing that communities with no or very little formal schooling use more concrete thinking than abstract thinking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's interesting. Um, yeah, that's a really good point. And in the paper on this chapter, um, I go into a little bit more of like potentially what some of the other variables could have been that would affect this time difference. Um, and thinking, actually, I did, schooling wasn't one in specific that I had looked at, but having more access, reliable access to electricity, um, having a difference in expansiveness of fishing grounds between the two communities. But this, this uh, thinking about school would be interesting. I think they both have access to primary education and secondary education. Um, and then for any other edu higher education, they um, on, from both villages, they have to go to the mainland of central Sulawesi, which is about eight hours away. So that's an interesting point. I hadn't looked at that yet. That is also a good question. My my guess would be that yeah that there that there would be more resources available on the main island. I actually spent a little more time in the schools in the outer island, the school in the outer island, and yeah, it definitely seemed resource strapped. 
Um, so yeah, this is a very good one. Mm -hmm. Any last questions online or in the room? Okay. Um, I actually have a couple more questions that I'm not sure I should ask you now or, or later given the, the time maybe I'll ask you, ask you later. Um, so I just wanted to give you a few minutes at the end. Oh, yes. Do you have any um, other slides you'd like to share? Thank you. Yes. So I have, um, I forgot the most important part. Uh, some acknowledgements. I want to say that the project was primarily funded by National Geographic um, as well as the School of Earth. And then I want to go. So um, as much as I love islands, no woman is one. And this, <laughs> and this uh, research is part of a large team effort. So I have very many people to thank and acknowledge. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Wong Crody, for chairing. I really appreciate it, keeping us on task. Um, I want to thank, of course, the EI for staff, um, everybody. I mean, Anne Marie, I, Anjana, Gabby, um, Jen, Miley, uh, Melly, and Sue. So these are some of our past people as well. I've been here a while. Um, but I just appreciate you all so much. You um, have helped keep the ship running smoothly, and you've brought so much warmth um, and cheer to your work and always made it feel like a family. And I just really appreciate that. Um, then, of course, uh, to my uh, wonderful advisors and committee members, um, you have been immensely supportive in so many ways. And Nicole, um, you're actually Wonder Woman. And um, somehow, um, you've always found such thoughtful ways to support uh, me as a scholar and a person and a mom. And I still read the book that you gave, Little Tor, um, every day, and he loves it. Um, and uh, you just you inspire me to always keep growing and challenging myself. Um, and then while also still creating community um, as you do so effortlessly wherever you go. So thank you. Um, Larry, I'm gonna switch to these notes, okay. Uh, so I still remember, you brought this up, but I still remember the first Zoom call we ever had. I was still at Duke and we were talking about going, uh, potentially working at Stanford together. Um, and I was so nervous, um, but your friendly, friendliness and warmth came through right away. Um, and you made me feel like, already supported and like I was on the right track and you've been doing that ever since I'm really grateful for that um, and I should say that all of the photography equipment for the photo voice effort um, Larry provided as well as the photography the camera equipment that um, you saw that made the images in the presentation so thank you um, <clears throat> Bill uh, you're such an intrepid scholar and um, adventurous soul I've always in, admired your adventurous spirit um, also, you, when you share your knowledge, it's so infectious, and I just hope that um, I've been able to bottle up a little bit of that magic um, as I move on to the next thing. Um, and that was especially true during um, my chance to go to Patagonia with you and help teach that course, and that was such an incredible experience, so thank you. Um, and then finally, Annette online. Um, I'm, just, I'm so grateful you've been willing to be a part of my committee, um, and you have juggled these time differences between here and the Netherlands. Um, and you've took me under your wing, taken me under your wing and really helped, made me feel more at home in the world of cultural anthropology, which I, which I find very intimidating, so I really appreciate that. Um, and then the four of you together, um, you've created these really amazing groups that you see listed up here, the Social Ecology Lab, Carter Lab, Ecology and Society, and Cor the Coral Cabal, um, and that I've been a part of during my time here, um, each of which has provided endless inspiration and support. Um, and you are the ones that have cultivated these like creative and welcoming environments. So I'm really grateful for you. Um, <clears throat> and then to my fellow colleagues and co-authors and friends who are part of these groups and beyond, including my beloved creative um, environmental writing group. Um, you all know who you are and I just am, I'm so grateful for all of your um, uh, collegialness and collaborative spirit. Um, and getting to work with you through these years and always providing constructive feedback and good humor to keep making it fun. Um, and then, of course, I have to give a big shout out to my epic all women cohort, um, which is not, I'm the last one standing. So, um, <laughs> Andrea made it here today in person and everyone uh, is tuning in online, but I, I couldn't have really done this without you. You've been just amazing. Um, in we've and also oh sorry the Ben Patson etc group is the uh, the the significant others and family members including the kids and the furry kids you see down there. Um, and we've just shared so many life memories together and I've learned so much from you all and I'm just very grateful to have your friendship. Um, 
Sorry, I was, there's only two, there's only this one and then one more. So then I, this research connected me with so many uh, ad, wonderful colleagues and friends and people I've come to consider family in Indonesia. Um, so of course, first and foremost, the fishing families that um, took the time to participate in this work that it wouldn't have happened without them. Um, and that's especially true of the families I stayed with, including uh, Mama and Papa Kia and their family, um, Mama and Papa Yadi, and these are um, families in the Bangay area. Uh, they just welcomed me in, made me feel uh, like I was at a home away from home. And then also um, Ibu Lady and Pak Irwin and all of their friends and, and wonderful friends and welcoming family in um, Luwuk, which is on the main island of Sulawesi. I'm so grateful for you all. I think maybe some of you are tuning all. It's like 3 a.m. there right now. But um, and then I'm also very grateful for my colleagues um, from the institutions I mentioned earlier, um, uh, <clears throat> Abigail and Pak Sam and Prof Jompa, who helped with all of the permitting and all of the moral and logistical support that was necessary for the project. Um, and who've also learned a lot from. And then, of course, the staff of Lini, Ibu Gayatri, the founder and director, um, colleagues, Pat Ismu, and then <clears throat> they were all immensely helpful. And then I um, dedicate this dissertation to Surya, who um, is no longer with us, and he's here. Um, <clears throat> but he, his name means sunshine, and I know everyone uh, who knew him misses him dearly, so this is dedicated to him. Um, and then, of course, to all my friends and family who I've known forever, <laughs> um, I, um, you've always been patient with my coming and going on various escapades, and you've always been there to welcome me back with open arms, which I'm really grateful for, um, especially to my parents who are here in the front row. Um, and uh, I'm so grateful you've always uh, encouraged a deep well of curiosity in me from, from a young age, um, and I'm just so grateful for that, as well as caring for the environment and specifically for um, the ocean. And to my godparents who are here as well, um, and they've always inspired a love for travel and um, understanding contexts that are very di different from my own. Thank you for all that. And uh, Michael's done a lot of editing on papers over the years, <laughs> um, as have my parents as well. Um, and then, of course, um, my partner Ben, the light of my life, and um, also our little baby boy Tor, and um, also Ben's extended family have helped watching our little boy um, at, when the times we needed it most. So I'm very grateful to his sister and mom and just everyone from his family who have been so supportive. Um, so, but the lights of my life, to, little Tor has made finishing the dissertation immensely more difficult, but <laughs> but more more rewarding. Um, and I, he makes me smile every day he wakes up now saying, fishy, fishy, um, when he points to a, a picture on the wall. Um, and then uh, to finally, of course, to my um, husband, Ben, he's been so patient. He's been so patient over the, uh, these years, uh, and especially when I was gone for a year and these last few months of endless working at nights and weekends. And um, I couldn't be more grateful for all your support and patience. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. So, um, thank you all for attending. So, please look out for an email later today by I Tren, and uh, she's the assistant director at Yeager for Student Services to announce the results. Um, with the passing of Shannon Stephens, we'll be hosting an in person reception at 2 p.m on the Y2B2 second floor terrace. Okay. So look out for an email. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for staying late too.